thanks so much to Queenstown Primary for those two uh, amazing contributions to our morning. We've had some fantastic um, performances over the last few days. So, our second to last keynote session, we're talking about well-being uh, and broadly, I guess, the concept of resilience. And Mike King talked yesterday about how important it is for children and young people to feel and know and be told that they are loved. And I mentioned that speech that I know many of you would have seen from the headmaster of New Plymouth Boys, which went viral actually a few months ago. And I thought I'd share a little bit of it um, before we head into this session. This is what Paul um, Verich had to say about uh, the context in which we can talk about well-being, in, in his case, in a boys' school, but certainly what he has to say is applicable in all schools, I think. Uh, he says, the Kiwi way, the Kiwi male way especially, is conditioned to not say, I love you. Blokes need to harden up, to toughen up, and you don't want to show what is perceived as weakness or to use highly offensive phrases like uh, being a sissy or being a girl about it. If you have a good mate, you make fun of him, you have banter, it's what we do, and most of us are guilty of that, me included. This is what he said to his boys. He said, you may feel uncomfortable about this speech, and the common reaction when you're uncomfortable is to joke about it, tease, elbow your mate, and say, the headmaster just said, love, what a weirdo. <laughs> or you might run around in the playground saying, I love you with no sincerity. You are simply doing this because society has trained you to be uncomfortable about the word love. Society has conditioned you to reject it, and it's not your fault. But don't be scared of love. Be brave and shake the stigma and immaturity that we have around it as a country. Be more adult than the adults who also struggle with this more than you may realize. Love is a word you need to understand. You need to get comfortable with it. If we have any chance of reversing the trend of young people feeling helpless, and we talked about that yesterday as well, we have a greater chance of overcoming it by caring for each other. I'm not expecting you to run around the playground saying I love you to your mates. I expect your teachers won't say thanks for your homework and by the way, I love you. But love is the only word I can find and the only word I can use to get through to you how much we as a school actually care for you. We are tough at this school because we care about you. How do I know you're cared for? You only need to see the care and compassion for our students when something goes horribly wrong, a parent very sick, or a traumatic injury. But love is not soft. Love is not easy. It's hard as it requires both strength and vulnerability at the same time and doing the right thing. Not necessarily the easy thing for those you love and those that love you. This was the headmaster's message to his boys. If you are struggling, it's okay. I want each and every one of you to know that you have friends, family, and a school community that deeply cares for you, even if we don't show it, even if we don't openly express it. We simply don't do this enough, and as adults, we need to step up. We need to do better if we are to expect you to follow our lead. And those words were picked up and run by many media organisations, and rightly so, I think, and a particularly um, brave speech, really, um, for a principal to give um, his students. So well-being in schools, both for staff and for students, how can we create a safe culture where conversations uh, like the one that Paul Verich had with his students are able to take place, and also uh, for those conversations to translate into meaningful uh, connection and relationships in a community where we're able to support each other, as we talked about uh, this morning with that analogy of a tree not being able to function effectively without a strong forest around it. Dr. Sven Hansen has pioneered preventative medicine stress mastery, and the performance mindset. We heard uh, from Sven uh, on the couch this morning. He has worked with many global sports and educational organizations to build resilience and well-being within those organizations by integrating physical, emotional, cognitive, and moral resilience into life, leadership, and business. As the founder of the Resilience Institute, he's helping leaders just like you to craft resilience into their teams. Please give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Jen, and thank you so much for uh, having us back here. So uh, I'd like to start today with um, some Harvard research that was inspired by a New Zealand physiotherapist who noticed, as I noticed as these young kids were doing, doing the dance, uh, more and more children 
are developing problems with their neck and shoulders with headaches. And this Steve August called Eye Posture. And he contacted Amy Cuddy, professor at Harvard University, who you've all probably heard about the power pose. Right, so Amy Cuddy thought, interesting idea. I wonder if posture has anything to do with assertiveness, leadership, how you express yourself. So the way they did this is they got a bunch of groups out and they got one on a desktop, one on a laptop, one on an iPad, one on an iPhone. Sorry, each group, so a group of people in each. They gave all of the participants exactly the same five minute task. So whether you're working for five minutes on your desktop or down there with your iPhone, same five minute task. And then they had a very basic assertiveness exercise. And this exercise was that within 10 minutes of you completing the, the task, you had to go and get a researcher to come and close off for you. Do you think there's any difference between the group that did it on, an I, on, a, on a desktop and the group that did it on an iPhone? How much more assertive are people who work on a desktop versus those who work on an iPhone? Anyone know the answer to that? All right, so the assertiveness behavior was 94% on desktop and laptop. Not much difference between the two. Once you were on an iPhone, it dropped to 50%. That's a five minute task. I've been sitting here on the sides watching most of you on your devices for two and a half days. And I'm wondering, in a dark room like this, maybe not always paying attention to your posture, desperately trying to get the pearls of wisdom, there's been some great wisdom, I wonder if that's combat pushing against your haora or your leadership. So I'd like you to go on a little experiment with me. I'm asking you to be brave. I'd like to put your devices down under the chair safely, right? Treat them like your child. I know how important your devices are. I would like you to put them down. I know this is going to be very hard. Some of you have already got a tachycardia. Some of you have got outright anxiety. All right. And we're going to address the topic uh, in, in a slightly different way of eudaimonia. How many of you honestly could give us a good, let's say your school, a good definition of eudaimonia? Can I have a show of hands? How many of you believe you could describe eudaimonia? All right, that's kind of sad. So we're going to experiment with this, uh, and you, you're going to learn it. So can you all stand up, please? Now, if you're going to fix eye posture, it's really important to loosen up. So let's just roll our shoulders just a little. Circle, lengthen the breath, particularly the out breath, round the other way. All right, really good. Then see, without hurting anyone near you, just grab your hands gently behind your back. Open your chest. Stretch your arms back, look up towards the ceiling, gently breathe in, and exhale fully. All right, fantastic. And then the key part to stretching and correcting the headaches and the neck and the shoulder issues is to learn to tuck your chin in. All right, so the foundation of eye posture is submission. All right, your testosterone plummets, your cortisol screams up. When you tuck your chin in, your spine becomes upright. When you do that, your testosterone goes back up, your cortisol goes down, you are much more powerful in your presence. All right? Or mana, if you like. So tuck the chin in, really reach back, lengthen, and then I'd like you to look round to the left. And then over to the other side, down to the right. And then tuck the chin in again. Keep your, your finger on the chin and just gently stretch to the side. And notice the tension down the side of the trapezius muscle. It's a really important muscle. You know, any of us who are working under pressure in a difficult environment really should be thinking about stretching that every day. And then tuck in the other side and down to the side. All right, good. Now, the second part is this, maintaining that posture, maintaining your openness. I'd like you to pair up. And I'd like you to very briefly explore with each other, when was the last time you as a principal absolutely, remember what Jan said, loved your life? I want you to pull out of each other a situation that you can remember in the last years or two where you thought, you know what, I love this job, 
I love my life. I cannot believe how blessed I am. You have three minutes. Mark, set, go. Okay, thank you. And before you sit down, what I'd like you to do is just give each other a little bit of feedback on each other's posture. To what degree are you authentically demonstrating your presence? All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> so, what I'd like to do is explore this idea of eudaimonia, a little bit about what it is, and I hope through that we can solve some of the challenges of work-life balance, well-being, resilience, what are these things make sense of it, uh, and then to look at some hows for you as principals. Uh, it's a heck of a life. All right, so taking care of yourself is where it all begins. If you're not taking care of yourself, at a really high level of excellence, you know, the school suffers. And uh, it's really, really important. So we'll keep that simple and practical. Just to be really clear, all of the slides are going to be available. Rosie and the multimedia team are videoing this. If you go to that website, you can get all this stuff in abundance, right? You do not need to write anything. Just relax. Just be present. All right, really would like to encourage you to do that. So we're unabashedly uh, clear. We have a vision for schools. We think there is an opportunity to encourage these ideas of bounce, bounce, of true human growth, of connection, and of creativity in the school environment. And I don't know of any other place where this is perhaps in today's time more important. But we're not going to talk about that today. I'd like to address specifically this issue of can resilience be learned. Let's uh, just quickly get a show of hands. How many of you, a little bit unsure, in fact, might even believe resilience cannot be learned? Can I have a show of hands? Those of you who think it's not something we should really try and learn, you know? You get it somewhere else. One. Do I see any others? So, you know, here's one way you might look at, at the idea. This is the work of Richard Davidson. He's talking in New York next week. Uh, he's the guy who looks into brains. He has more money than just about anyone else. He goes to a bunch of conferences. I try to follow him around. He's like a bit of a hero for people like us. All right? Richard Davidson is, is probably one of the most advanced uh, brain biologists or neurobiologists we have today. And he's written a book called The Emotional Life of Your Brain, which is written for you and I to try and understand what his studies have shown clearly. All right, here's what Davidson and his team at University of Wisconsin-Madison do. First thing is they say, where does a function happen in the brain? When someone is doing X, can I see where in the brain it's working? Where does the blood flow go? Where's the neural activity? Where's, where's the oxygen consumption? And you do this with, with various tests. Then they will test that particular X function and say, all right, well, we've got those 10 people to do it, and, you know, there's a bunch of different scores. And then they have a training system where they say, right, we want to train X. All right, and they put people through, generally, it's about a six-week training program, and then they test them again. Did the performance of X improve, yes or no, and did the brain change? So it's quite a good way to see what can you actually change. Here's what Davidson reports in his book. The first thing, there is absolutely no doubt that we can measure train and show the improvement in humans' ability to bounce. All right? As we get into a struggle, the brain changes. The front part of your brain starts to shut down and the reptilian brain starts to get very antsy. And we feel agitated and restless and anxious and maybe frustrated and a little bit sparky and we don't sleep so well. When we're in that state, we make a lot of bad decisions. And the worst thing about not, uh, not seeing this is you don't even know you're making bad decisions. All right, bounce is the ability to downregulate that reptilian brain and upregulate the prefrontal cortex. 
All right? It is that simple. We do not need to get more complex than that. It is crystal clear. Within six weeks, people can get better at bounce. And there are dozens of techniques and dozens of little ways to go about, and we've each got to find the way that's most uh, realistic for us. The second thing Davidson has shown is that we have insight. Insight happens just behind the prefrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate, and insular cortex. And, you know, a simple example of insight, and, and one that Davidson uses, is can you right now, try it, feel your heartbeat. People with high levels of insight, lots of activity in that, that area of the brain, the insular in particular, can actually feel and count their heartbeats very accurately. People who don't have such good insight or self-awareness, what are you talking about? My heartbeat? You know, they've never even thought about their breathing, let alone their heart breathe. All right? And again, within six weeks of listening for your breath, of listening for your heartbeat, of naming your emotions, your self-awareness centers of the brain work much more better and in any self-awareness test you perform better. Third one, attention. This is the one we all know and, and it's very popular now with the mindfulness uh, movement. There is no doubt that combined with the nucleus accumbens, the dopamine systems, it's part of what the app world and the, and the, the iPhone world has done very well, it, it drags our attention away. Some of you are already feeling, I must just check that email, damn it. How am I going to get from under my chair? That's your attention system, you know, it's going to push you away from me back towards your iPhone because it's very compelling uh, territory. Again, we can measure this kind of dopamine focused conscious activity as attention and we can build it, all right, dramatically. Fourth, positivity. All right, this is an easy one. Most of you have heard about this in all kinds of different ways. This is the movement of positive psychology, but you can very quickly and very easily increase the amount of positivity as measured in the brain. All right, crystal clear. And we know that if you are expressing more positive emotions, basically in a, in a lay of sort of three positives to every negative emotion, you are healthier, your heart beats better, your blood pressure is better, your immune system is better. You, you have much better emotional connection with others. You feel much more happy and your brain works much better. You've got a greater breadth of attention and more depth of focus. All right, that's a big win from positivity and you know, I, I'm not sure we should trivialize it. Then another one that many of us are thinking about, for those of you who have been in Christchurch, for those of you, and we're working with some schools in Mexico at the moment, who've gone through this earthquake. Now, that's a little bit frightening, right? And when you have a post-traumatic distress, your hippocampus, that part of the brain, fries, becomes very thin, and doesn't work very well. And what we know we can do is we can help people build back their situational awareness. All right, to be able to, to be in a situation that's really uncomfortable, but to stay present. All right, and, and that leads to post-traumatic growth rather than post-traumatic distress. Again, proven, we can do it. Right? And you know, a lot of visual, spatial and three-dimensional tasks like driving a taxi in London, you will have heard about, uh, improve that. And then you know, perhaps the last one, which has you know, been up for a bit of debate, and you might have seen this in the listener, is empathy. All right, we can definitively, and at the Mind and Life conference last year, Davidson was actually sitting next to me, Dalai Lama, Matthew Ricard, all these guys who study uh, Max Planck Institute, empathy, it's crystal clear. We can learn to be more physically attuned to each other. We can learn to read each other's emotions in face and tone of voice better. All right, and we can learn to read each other's thoughts, what we call perspective taking. All right, so that's a bit of a hard response to can one learn the stuff. Right, let's get back to you and you, your horror. Now, I mean, this is well known, right? It's, it's crystal clear. It's, it's in our society. We know in all kinds of different ways. We honor the body. We honor the emotions. We honor the, the mind. We honor our community. And we honor the spirit. Eudaimonia is the top. Eudaimonia was the ancient Aristotelian idea of the good life. You for good, daimon spirit. So when you feel in good spirit, when you say, I love my life, 
You remember the last time someone said to you, I love my life? It's absolutely delicious. Absolutely delicious. You know, and I think back, you know, we lived in a crazy world, right? We, we were either eating sugar or flying through the air without a helmet, correct? Uh, there was no safety in our youth. And uh, my principal was a very scary man. He was called Mango. The reason he was called Mango is he had a big domed bald head and he went round the school in waving black uh, gowns. He was terrifying. All right, most of us had post-traumatic stress after every situation that he came out of his office. And he is, of course, allowed to beat you violently. Uh, but I have to give Mango his due. Uh, I really respected him. And in probably three ways, that man made my life. In subtle and very clever ways. And, uh, you know, he, he was someone, I think, who did in a pretty scary way, and maybe it's not so appropriate today. But he was someone who really honored that good life. He took it personal. You know, he wanted the kids in that school to be up there and worked really hard. Interesting, interesting man. So here's your next conversation. I'm going to welcome you to stand up. Right now, how's your haora? What altitude are you flying right now? Mark said, go. Try and make sense of, you know, where are you on that sense of a spiral? Stand up, stretch out, open out again. Explore it. What are you feeling? Okay, thank you very much. So in the rest of the time we've got, and I think, you know, if truth be told, I'm probably just here to warm you up and, and keep you safe from Graham Henry, right? Because trust me, if you were in his all-black team right now, you would not like to be going for a training session with him at 12 p.m., correct? It's completely brutal. How do you think the all-blacks think about this? Anyone remember the 2007 World Cup? All right, so Graham Henry knows all about that. Maybe even tell us a little about this. But we had a team that froze. They lost it. They couldn't dig their way through a trivial game, frankly, and I'm a bit judgmental here, uh, when they should have been able to. But what that initi initiated, and you know, Richie McCaw's book is really brilliant, and the movie's good on this, is, is to learn how to bounce to learn how to do the job even when things are really pear-shaped. The ref goes against you, bad luck, someone injured, kicked off, doesn't matter, to still be able to get it together. And what the All Blacks mastered between 2007 and 2011 was bounce. And I think we can all do that. Um, stuff happens, right? More recently. Now, it was pretty scary for us to see that. What do you think if you're young Peter Burling? He pretty much destroyed that campaign. Split second. What do you think his heart was doing? What do you think his feelings were doing? We actually know. First thing he paid attention to was his team. Is my team safe? Everyone okay? And he went straight onto his safety routines. In such a critical situation, maybe the end of a career. Right? These skills can most definitely be learned. Not only that, but this team had their boat reconstructed from two broken boats, they were ready to race the next day. And then they went on to win that cup. I mean, wow, that's bounce, right? And, you know, all the way through, these athletes are now tracked. We can watch their heart rates and their blood pressures as they're doing this. And we're starting to understand at a very granular level what's going on. All right, so look, we cannot solve all these problems. This is scary. This is the dark side. All right, this is something we maybe all need to be much more honest about. Stuff isn't getting better. We're overloaded, unbelievably overloaded. You know, if you think about the second level, you know, of disengaged, ADHD is becoming an epidemic. One in six boys are being treated with these, these uh, pills, you know, these basically uh, Ritalin and others. I mean, that's insane. One in 20 girls. All right, and it's increasing fast. When you look at withdrawal, loneliness, you know, the autism spectrum, these are places where people go where they're not emotionally connected. All right, it, it gets more scary. We know that the autism rate, if you just measure in absolute terms, has increased 36-fold. So obesity has doubled. 
all right, and a and little bit more in teenagers. But, but 36 fold, that's a, a big increase. And yet you go to most autism websites and they'll tell you it's genetic. Really? Can genes change in one generation? I don't think so. All right, we know so. Uh, so there's some really interesting questions, of course, they're diagnostic issues, and if you take them all out, and the Scandinavians have done this, it's about a 14-fold increase that we can say is a true increase in autism. It's a lot. You know, and as we go down, you look at the inflammatory diseases, the anxiety. Anxiety, I mean, official uh, scores around about 10%, but I've seen a number of anecdotal reports that in schools in New Zealand it can be as high as 25 and even 30%. I wonder what it is in your school. Do you know? And do we know what the cost of anxiety is? Uh, important question. You know, we've got inflammatory disease, the asthmas, the bowel problems, the skin rashes, way more common today. All right, why is this? And, you know, clearly we've got the darker side, increasing and a concern. So, and I'm 100% with Mike King here, we don't just put an ambulance at the cliff. That's not the point. I mean, putting in an ICU doesn't stop heart attacks or strokes. You actually have to get upstream. You've got to get into how people move, into their arteries, you know, into their blood pressure. And that's the kind of thing we've got to understand to be able to beat this epidemic of, of you know, people are not living the greatest lives. So the first kind of remedy is bounce. All right, to be really, really clear in your own life, because I think this is where it all begins. If you can demonstrate bounce, Kids will pick it up really quickly. It is so important to show this in your own life. And it's hard, right? Because life is challenging and sometimes our kids uh, take us down. Sometimes they, they help us go, go down there. But to have a strong bounce practice that you can drill down into very little simple things. All right, so Mike talked about the little voices in your head. You know, if I hear those voices in my head, I just breathe out and breathe out, and if they don't go away, then I go, um. It's really ridiculous, but you know what? Voices don't go with me in the car anymore. They got really bored. They've left. Freedom, all right? So if they come back, I know exactly what to do. You know, I know there's sometimes, at the end of the day, it's been a hard day, all I want to do is, is sit down in front of the TV and watch some, you know, stupid stuff, all right? That's not actually the answer. When I feel like that's what I need, actually that's the time to say, Sue, let's go for a walk. All right, that's the time to connect. And to have these simple go-tos is very, very powerful. And there's a really interesting book, if you doubt any of this, just recently came out by Alex Korb, called The Upward Spiral, about what you can do to get out of the spiral from depression without taking medication. All right, I'm not going to spend more time on, on that. Or the key to what we want to talk about in, in eudaimonia is to master these kind of five levels. And the first thing is to master calm. And I just want to do this practically, right? So I'm going to suggest we practice that. So to do calm, you've got to breathe properly. That means you've got to sit properly. So can you all come to the front of your chairs? Lengthen your spine. Again, remember the chin chuck, tuck just a little. Just relax your eyes, close them if you're comfortable, or look at the floor between your feet. And I'd like you just to, to, to relax. Let your attention drop from your brain into your belly. All right, notice the feeling of your belly expanding as you breathe in, and the collapse or falling as you breathe out. And then lengthen your spine just a little longer. Make sure you're breathing through the nose. Try to make the out breath about six seconds. Slow, smooth. And see if you can even feel your muscles relax, particularly your face, your jaw, your tongue, as you exhale. And then gently into a four second inhale. And slowly into that six second exhale. And maybe on the inhale, you kind of feel the fullness, the oxygen, the life force. Appreciate it. And as you exhale, just send that force out as kindness, gentleness to the people around you. And that's it. Right? So if we can learn to breathe low, 
if we can take it into a simple, simple practice, and this is proven in any kind of very scary events, as well as in the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts of life. This is all we need to do, to be able to have enough awareness to know that right now I'm not in the best place to react. I've got to stop, check posture, exhale, slow the heart rate, activate the vagal nerve, the parasympathetic system, and what you're doing is bringing your heartbeat into a completely different rhythm called heart rate variability. When you do that, this front part of the brain does what it needs to do without any effort. If you try to act without a go-to, chances are you'll make a mistake or it's unbelievably difficult. You have to burn juice in this prefrontal cortex. If you can stop and do those three breaths, you take away that drag and the brain does the right thing. All right, and, and Robert Sapolsky has measured this again and again. He's got a brilliant book out called Behave. I mean, this is going to become, I think, core reading in schools, just published. And he's also on TED Talks, Robert Sapolsky. Uh, he, he will be in those references too. But a fascinating book on, on how when people behave well, it's effortless. It's the same thing when you see in the All Blacks. They will do things that look unbelievable, and it looks effortless. And actually, because they've practiced again and again and again, deliberate practice, it just comes. They don't have to think about it. They kind of just do it. Uh, and that's part of what I think we've got to think about in this area. If we can understand this relaxation, then we can step into, into the body stuff. Now, I'm going to say a lot about body. Just one warning. It's daylight savings this weekend. All right, with this population here, a percent of you are probably going to die on Monday morning. Are you aware of that? And do you know why that is? And could you explain it to your kids? Right. Why is it that heart rates increase by 24% on the Monday following the introduction of daylight savings? All right. And if any of you are going back to school on Monday morning, do you know how bad a morning it's going to be? All right. So these simple little trivial things of allowing your clock to dysregulate, which is what daylight savings does, it actually increases death rates on Monday morning. It's one of the most dangerous times to be an emergency doctor in any hospital in the world is when they introduce daylight savings. I think the government is trying to cull us off, uh, but you know, you come to your own uh, conclusion on that. Point with the physical, right? Let's stay away from the science. We know this stuff is important. You want to hierarchy this in your life. You want to be a great leader. You want to support your horror. You're going to do four things. One, you have to exercise even if it's short burst high intensity exercise. Two, you absolutely have to do that breathing, relaxation, meditation type practice. Three, you've got to get your sleep bulletproof. All right, in leadership and McKinsey have shown this crystal clear. The functions of leadership require a good night's sleep. About seven and a half hours, regular times, consistent with your biological clock and allowing for deep sleep before you go. And so I'm not going to say anything about this. I'd like you to pair up again. Feel free to stand up because you've got a very exciting thing coming 10 minutes time. What, uh, what are your key practices? All right, that's the first thing I'd like you to share with each other. What are the daily practices we, you have in your lives are non-negotiable? And what's one that you need to add? I've indicated a couple that I think are really, really important. All right, three minutes. Daily practice. What are your non-negotiables, current and future? All right, super. Thank you. So, what if every classroom in your school had its own daily or class practice? You know, I think that may be the classroom of the future. I certainly know that in elite training environments, that's already how they train. There's very clear, carefully thought through structure. Every opportunity is explored. Is this an opportunity for learning? How do we catch that little situation, that little spat between two kids, and turn it into an interesting learning experience about emotions, about empathy, about respect, about looking at different perspectives? 
All right, through to, you know, how many of you get your kids up five times a class, maybe? Get them to bounce once or twice. Even little things like this make a huge difference. How many of your kids can categorically, and it's a question by a chap who wrote uh, Anxious, uh, Joseph Ledoux. How many of your kids leave school confident and capable of relaxation? I think that's a really mission critical metric. Because what we're seeing, if I talk to my kids who are now at university, most of their friends are dealing with disabling anxiety. They've been able to get through the best schools with the most caring teachers and parents and principals, and they still cannot conquer the most simple evidence of anxiety. We know we can do that, right? We've covered that already. And I think this should be a daily practice. All right, as we go through this, you'll see more and more this isn't about thinking. This is about execution, deliberate execution. You know, when you wake up in the morning, do you have a plan? Or do you lie in bed, mm, one more minute, oh, it's raining today, should I go to the gym? No, maybe not. You can waste most of your intellectual resource just with one block like that. It is wake up, get up, and go. You've got a plan, you execute that plan. You don't have the available energy to have a debate with yourself about whether or not you're going to do these simple little things. You just do them, like cleaning your teeth. All right? You don't have to do all of them. But I think each one of us has to work out what for us are the simple practices that keep us up there and present, uh, keep our aura up there as, as great, great leaders. All right, this is going to be part of it. I don't want to spend time here, but I think this is where, it's, you know, when you're thinking about any situation, the awareness of emotion, the skillful management of emotion is one of the most fertile areas for our generation to develop, but most particularly our kids. When we were in school, we didn't know enough about emotion. Nobody bothered. The last person to look at emotion when I was at school was Darwin, 150 years previous. In the, no, it's not funny, right? It's, it's, it's actually a massive opportunity. The lead thinker in, in emotions now, Paul Ekman, he says, not normal. It's completely abnormal to name your emotions. And now we're living in a world where it's, it's mission critical. All right, because the, the emotional world is your switch between the base brain and the front brain. The moment you can say to yourself, you know what, I'm a bit bored with this, I really can't wait to see Graham, you've noticed boredom, sadness, anger, anxiety. When you name that emotion, the front of the brain lights up. Now we have choices. If you execute those emotions from the low part of the brain, it is almost impossible to, to change it. But we need to cut the cloth <laughs> to fit the man. <clears throat> a last word on, on, on mind. You know, I've said this before and I apologize a, a little bit. Uh, but, you know, the brain is an amazing thing, isn't it? I mean, we have all these pictures of the brain, bright colors and, and all these fancy research things. And yet, when you go to the mind and life or the big neurobiology conferences, they'll tell you on the one hand we have 50,000 to 70,000 thoughts per day. Wow, that's amazing. Do you track your thoughts? You know, you're listening to those angels and demons. Uh, and then you've got to ask yourself, if you look at, let's say it's just 60,000 for average, how many of those 60,000 thoughts are on the angel side and how many on the demon side? And then you've got to work out what do these little buggers say? And that gets really curious. And after a while, when you start to look at thoughts, you'll actually see that thinking is a bad idea. A really bad idea. All right? And it's very, very simple to work out why that is true. The brain cannot do many things. Right? It can either be oriented to what's happening here and now. You're present. 100%. Attentive, alert, situation where flexible, ready to go. Or, you're in the future. How am I going to deal with that thing tomorrow? What if this happens? What if that happens? As soon as you let your brain go into the future, are you still in the present? Can't be. Right? You've taken your leadership resources into an impossible future. If you think about the past, I really shouldn't have. That parent was so tricky. I can't believe I let myself down. In fact, she makes me wild. Now your brain is in the past, not in the leadership of the present. 
All right, so the first kind of piece to work with us, and I think, you know, kids get this, right? My kids got this really early, and it was wonderful to see my son, who was a classic warrior. He would sit in the car, what if dad, the sky falls on head, what if that tree gets blown across the road? Endless, what if, what if, what if? And we used this simple idea to help him say, you know what? Have a look at that what if. It's reasonable. It's helping your life. Or do you need to find a way to just not give it any more oxygen? You know, let it just fizzle. Uh, and, and that's powerful, right? Because we know when your mind is quiet, you're at your best. If you go back to the times in your life where you had a day that you just rock and rolled, it was wonderful. What we know from brain studies today is that front part of the brain is silent. We call it hypofrontality. At your best, you don't think. That is why when you're at your best, time just gone. Where did that afternoon go? Because when you're at your best, your brain doesn't have energy or resources for thinking or for timekeeping. It's just in the game. All right, so learning to be a little bit more skillful with thought uh, is, is kind of the base for really where eudaimonia is. I think we'll take one simple uh, perspective on that. Uh, and, and that is to, to really encourage you to find your flow. You know, how do you create a leadership world where every day you know you're going to get a little of that wow time. You're going to be devilishly effective. So McKinsey has shown in his senior executives inflow are five times more effective than senior executives when they're not in flow. It's a five times multiplier. You add that to what Steve was saying earlier today, that's power. All right, so to really understand, because we do understand now, we understand the states of mind. We know we need a challenge. All right, but to get into flow, you've got to relax. You've got to be able to breathe. You've got to be able to trust. All right, and then flow, very extraordinary things happen. I won't spend time on that now. It's exciting, right? And then there's a really important recovery phase. And I think for many leaders today, it's the recovery phase that we, we, we're, we're crimping down. Jan and I were talking about there's no redundancy left in our lives. There's no margin. Right? As a leader, you've got to have time for margin. You've got to have recovery time uh, to be able to, to get back in the game. So how might we play this? Let's just look. This is uh, the work by Peak. Um, so we all know short-term memory, seven digits, right? been in psych theory for about 150 years, nobody argues that. So if I read out numbers one per second, on average most of you will remember six, seven, maybe eight. Occasional person will remember nine, correct? Can you in increase the number of digits you could remember and recite back to me if I read them? How much? Does anyone know? How many? Yeah, so it's interesting. So the first uh, study on this was, uh, was about uh, 82. And then they got someone else, and she only got there to about 30-something. The next person got to 120. Bang. Current testing, people are remembering 500 digits. 500 digits. This is the beginning of learning, right? The marathon, 1908, 2 hours 55. Most of you and I could do that today, couldn't we? All right, this year, fastest marathon on two hours. Wow, you know. Perfect pitch. We used to believe like about 6% of the population had perfect pitch. They had to have the genes and they had to have the training. Japanese group got together, they got these kids between three and six, trained them in pitch, and, and within months, 100% of these kids had perfect pitch. All right, this is profound stuff, right? We often think, you know, smart people play chess. Not true. Intelligence, IQ, is a disabler for good chess playing. Because chess isn't about thinking, it's about remembering. It's about having seen that board so many times you know exactly what the options are, situation awareness. Again, not intelligence. Um, so there are some really interesting uh, pieces on that. And uh, uh, Anders Ericsson has actually put some work to it, and I'll finish with this because I think it's a really interesting future for, for education. It's done at the University of British Columbia, engineering, smart, 
uh, lecturers, well, the best actually, uh, Nobel Prize winners, and they decided, well, what if we change the teaching just a little? And, and what they did here was, you know, they had a control group and a trial group. Control group still got the Nobel Peace Prize lecturers. Uh, the trial group had a little bit of pre-reading, same as the, con the, the control group. Uh, they got two teachers, but they were PhD students they had never taught before, not once. All right, so no expertise teachers, just facilitators, basically. And the, the goal was teach these kids to think like physicists in dealing with an electrics problem. And uh, they went through small group primarily and a little bit of review. These PhDs were allowed to give 10 minute mini lectures if the kids got stuck. That's it. No other teaching. The kids otherwise had to learn in the flow. And then they measured the results. All right. Engagement, self-assessment doubled in the trial group. The uh, multiple choice, there's the actual uh, results. So essentially what that boils down to is that twice as many, or 2.5 times as many right answers in the trial group. Wow, that's interesting. All right, I wonder if we could play with something like that in, in education. And uh, really do recommend that if you want to explore this, both for yourself as a leader, but also in terms of how we develop our kids, in this world where everything is changing and moving and becoming really, really interesting. That is a stunning book, All right? The idea that practice trumps intelligence every time. Uh, very powerful idea, but very, very specific and well worth learning. Right, last word with, with the person next to you. All right, in terms of your own, Haora, what are you gonna take from today to do? Just one or two things to share with each other. This I will do for my leadership. Thank you very much, guys.